everyone and welcome to today's webinar, Machine Translation Use Cases, eDiscovery and Corporate Governance, which is part of the Top 10 Enterprise Machine Translation Use Case Series. My name is Kate Bradshaw and I will be your host. Your SGL speakers today are Kirti Vashi, who is a Language Technology Evangelist, and Luca Esposito from Nuance Communications, who is a MIA lead for OEM Enterprise. We expect today's webinar will last about 45 minutes, followed by a Q&A session. I'll now hand you over to Kirti to begin the presentation today. Good morning. Um, let me begin with just a current review of the digital landscape today. Uh, as we look out upon the world, we see that there is a content explosion that like, has never been seen before. Every two years, there is more information created than the previous 500 years. Now, this is unprecedented in the history of humanity. We see a huge impact of social media and social networking on as deep, as strong influences of business prospects and of business success. Uh, we are currently in a very high hype period of machine learning and artificial intent, intelligence applications, and they are indeed solving problems that we thought computers would never be able to solve. So that is also a time of great excitement, but I think also a time of too much hype. Um, at the last Davos conference, we saw that the CEOs, when asked what are the two most uh, important issues for, of the day, they mentioned that cybersecurity and data privacy were the two key concerns that they had. And on any given day today, we're seeing that over 600 billion words are being translated by machine translation portals on each and every day. Now, when we look at the global enterprise, we see similar kinds of trends. And you know, so while that is happening out in the world, within the world, we also see that global corporations are now sending emails between um, different divisions and different partners uh, across the globe that social media and social network are now being understood as important messages for marketing and product teams to watch and monitor because they determine business success and failure. Um, it is very common nowadays for large global enterprises to have teams distributed across the world where you may have a design or a marketing team in the U.S., you may have design and engineering teams in the Europe, and often manufacturing in somewhere in the Far East. The customer support situation today is completely a global situation since everyone can get onto the web, since 5 billion people can anyway to, so far today. The ability and the need for organizations to monitor the, the kinds of issues that customers have across the globe and to be able to respond in a timely and effective manner is critical and is especially important for delivering meaningful and successful uh, customer experience uh, scenarios. So it is a critical issue for the companies today. And also in a global enterprise, lots of confidential financial, human resource, and trade secret information has to grow, grow across the globe. Um, this, this is the reason why there is so much focus in recent times on this area we call information governance. It's a discipline that is designed to help and create order within this information deluge that both individuals are facing and global enterprises are facing. And information governance is a discipline and a strategy to help manage data in a meaningful way so that establishing policies and standards on how you keep and destroy, how you protect the data, how you make it available to the people that need it. Um, this is another chart that describes how the information governance function and or discipline within the organization focuses on information retention and archival architecture of information so that, you know, salespeople have it when they need it, support people have it when they need it, 
integrated into accounting system so that cost and um, customer records are quickly pulled up when they're needed so we, you know, to improve the quality of the customer experience. Um, and just basically the whole overall management of the information that organizations need to have. And it is a response to the information deluge that individuals and enterprises face today. This information explosion is made even more complicated because it tends to be more and more often a multilingual one. So it is crossing languages all the time. Within the organizational um, framework, there is constant communication going on across countries and between more and more often between languages and collaboration across languages is becoming increasingly necessary. So what has happened in the last few years, or in the last 10 years particularly, is that more and more people are using uh, public generic MT portals. You know, it's a, these are just, they tend to be understood as being free and they're one size fits all. So there's, you know, there's very little control that enterprises have in terms of what they can make it do, what, you know, how they can tune it to their specific needs and how they can fit it into their organizations. And it's a one size fits all approach with, with clear data security and data leakage issues and not integrated into the enterprise IT infrastructure where it needs to be. So very often you see um, employees in global corporations cutting and pasting content from emails, from content management systems, and from documents to try and understand what someone in China might be saying um, and, you know, just be able to function on a day-to-day -day basis with colleagues across the world. Unfortunately, the providers of these free machine translation services need to use your information to need to use the customer's information to improve their services and they make very clear in their terms of service agreement that they have the right to use this information and modify it and you know, create derivative works to improve the quality of the service. And so this, all this content that people are putting in these portals becomes fodder for their machine learning processes. Um, and thus, the need for information governance. Information governance, and here's a definition from Forrester, and I'm not going to just read it out, but it's about managing your information, making sure that there's security and privacy and that the, the value of the information is maintained over the life of the information. You know, there is some information that has immediate value. Like today's emails are really valuable today because you need to act and respond. But those emails a year from now have much less value, but they may have some value for people who are trying to understand how a product was developed. And so you need to have that audit trail to see how the communications proceeded. So information governance policies are designed to address and manage all those kinds of needs. Um, you know, here's another way of looking at it is it's to help you control, to organize the content, and to provide the, and make it available in context that it needs to be. And again, it's an increasingly important requirement in organizations today because of the sheer volume. It, it, information governance is a response, a proactive response to the sheer volume of data that organizations have to deal with today. So it's important to understand what kinds of business use cases are we going to use information, you know, will information governance evolve? And there's three we're going to talk about in our webinar today. Um, the first one is e-discovery. Um, some say that e-discovery is a reactive response to, to something that, um, you know, a problem that arises or an issue that is triggered by some kind of external event. And it's, it's the, the need to go into your information and data resources and find important and relevant documentation. 
today's di digital experience and digital platforms mandate that any global organization has to monitor the interactions with the customer all through their customer journey with the enterprise. So information governance is now in increasingly being used to manage and focus on the customer experience. And increasingly this customer experience is not just through text and uh, internet interactions, but often through voice and video as well. So it is important to be able to manage that as well. Um, as we saw at the latest Davos uh, presentations, the CEOs are quite concerned about cybersecurity and data privacy. And there are now new regulations that are coming that um, that require companies and there are punitive um, conditions to not being able to comply to the regular regulations. So the level of urgency has increased dramatically in the last few years. There are many who say that basically information governance and e-discovery applications are focused on finding the needle in the haystack. It's getting to the right information in this massive um, mass of digital stuff that exists in an organization and that is relevant for specific business purposes. So again, the, 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 given that this, this mass of straw that we're dealing with here is multilingual, means that you need to have the ability to process language as well in addition to just the kind of information and the formats and you know the security aspects as well. So it, language has added this extra dimension of com complexity to this problem. And this is what the SDL MT solutions are focused on on helping enterprises deal with. You know, there are means to adapt to and comply with information governance policies wherever multilingual data is involved. You know, there's there's secure technology solutions that can be implemented within the organization tailored to enterprise terminology and integrated into the IT infrastructure and completely private and secure so that um, your analysis and your digging through the the data to find what you need when when uh, multiple languages are involved is made simpler. So let's take a, a closer look at e-discovery. E-discovery is most often involved with something called electronically stored information. You know that you will hear the acronym ESI used often there. And the two most frequent uses of this is in response to a request for production in a lawsuit. So it's, you know, when you have uh, some kind of legal action, it, you need to provide certain documents to prove that, you know, you, your, your side of the case. Um, so it, that is one very frequent use of e discovery applications. And now increasingly with data breaches and with, um, breakdowns in corporate security, internal corporate investigations, or even rogue employees. Um, in, the, in, the, in the national security and government use case, when you capture a terrorist computer, it is you, e discovery is the process by which they try and figure out, is there anything valuable on this computer? Do we need to understand what's going on? And the Electronically stored information is not just emails and documents. Now, more and more often, it involves voice content or, you know, you might be captured webinars. Like this webinar itself is going to be captured on video and audio and with these textual aspects. So anyone who wants to actually search through this will need to look at that. So e-discovery is a process by which, um, and, and this is the most common um, model used in the industry, and it's called the electronic discovery reference model. And if you look at the, the, the chart, you see on the left side of the chart that there is a, a faint light gray um, triangle that you know, shows that the process involves taking a lot of data and trying to winnow it down through some process 
of review analysis, you know, identification of the right kinds of data, and to try and build up more and more relevant data. So it's the process of taking large volumes of data and finding what is relevant. You know, again, this can be very simply ex explained and described by the finding the needle in the haystack. In the, in the litigation scenario, finding the smoking gun. And so it's the ability to look through large volumes of information and extract what is relevant and important. So there's four particular kinds of e-discovery use cases that we will just touch upon briefly you know, in this webinar. And um, the most common one is cross-border litigation in a global world in where more and more companies, even small companies today, have global aspects to them and have some international aspects to them. Cross-border litigation is a very frequent kind of e-discovery use case. Um, GDPR is going to drive many information governance initiatives because companies are going to need to understand what data are we keeping, what data are we allowed to keep. And to be able to monitor this on an ongoing basis and make sure that they are compliant because the penalty for, for not being compliant are very steep and very severe. But there are many who say that customer care and service analysis is one of the most important areas for e-discovery today because they drive the way the company will evolve and succeed or fail in, 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 the, in the modern world because today's customer can, is not under the control of marketing organizations like they were in yesteryear. Today's customer talks to each other. Today's customer shares their experiences. You know, when we buy something on Amazon, we look at what other customers have said and it influences what we buy. So when information is used and drives purchase behavior and ongoing you know, support and uh, future purchase behavior, it becomes much more critical. So e-discovery is also often used today in customer care and customer understanding the customer. In these days of data breaches and data breakdowns, you know, security breakdowns, often needed for internal investigations and any kind of due diligence applications. So let's take a closer look at the, at the uh, e-discovery. It's happening all over the world. There's, there's you know, there's cross-border litigation related to product liability, related to, um, to Patent infringement, you know, the Apple versus Samsung is a large case that involved hundreds of thousands of documents where lawyers on both sides were trying to make, one was trying to make the case that you copied our stuff, and the other one was saying that, no, we had our own invention. And um, there's, in some countries, foreign corrupt practices, you know, where bribery is a common practice, you know, there's issues around that. So it, it it varies across the world. You know, in Europe, GDPR is going to become a very big deal. But da again, data growth is the driver of all of this kind of activity. If we look at what these cross-border litigation issues, or you know, what the disputes are about, you'll see that contract issues are the dom dominating issue. But some of the most visible cases involve intellectual property infringement, you know, where a U.S. company might accuse a Chinese company of uh, intellectual property, you know, infringement, or you know, just companies within the same industry. You know, maybe say a few companies, in in a single country, may have cause for, um, you know, cause for litigation related to intellectual property. Product liability is also very um, is, a, is a use case where you have very large volumes of uh, information and the most visible one in, in recent years was the VW case that, you know, involved emissions manipulation and, you know, in that case, the Department of Justice asked Volkswagen to produce tens of thousands of documents related to their emissions, inspections, technology, and policy. 
So you can see that there are many actual events happening out there today that um, are driving the need for this kind of e-discovery application and driving the need for cross-language uh, capabilities. Um, there's other research being done that show that on, on a pretty steady basis now, we're seeing that international litigation is increasing, that the overall share of litigation in, in major law firms is increasing, the number of cross-border discovery processes that are happening, which means cross-language again, are increasing all the time. And in fact, Gartner is suggesting that 80% of all corporate litigation by 2020 will be multilingual. So the, the forces underlying the need for, these, for the technologies we're discussing today are very much at motion and are only going to increase in impact. And the need for a secure, so you know, the, a secure enterprise controlled empty service capability is going to become more and more critical for an organization to be able to process all the multilingual data that they need. And to ensure privacy, to ensure that it's tailored to their specific needs, and to ensure that it's integrated into their very specific analysis platforms, they need to go to someone that can address those needs. We also see today that social media communication is a much bigger factor. And it's a, it's a big factor in the way that you know, individuals communicate with each other in their personal lives, but it's also becoming a much bigger factor in the enterprise case, because even within the enterprise, you know, there's communications happening in forums like LinkedIn or Twitter, and, and you know, where business communications are happening there. And we're understanding that this has real impact on the consumer, consumer experience. Um, and to add to this social uh, net, social media driven uh, enterprise challenges, we also have the fact that data breaches are now much more common than many other things. And there's an increasing need for organizations to be able to say that, okay, we had a security breakdown, we need to understand what happened. Is it a rogue employee? Is it a breakdown in our service, in our protection policies? You know, what is it? So when you experience a data breach, there's ten, there needs to be a, an info, information governance initiative in place to try and understand what is going on and to make sure that it doesn't happen again in the future. The SDL machine translation solutions are designed to, to help this. You know, they're focused on the enterprise. They're secure and scalable. They can be tuned in terms of terminology, and so they're optimized for your specific needs, and they're tailored and unique to each enterprise. Now, going back to the specific cross-border litigation scenario, what happens in terms of the mass of documents that are coming through? We see that, that Gartner has analyzed the cost, you know, in terms of, you know, what it costs in the overall process. And what they have found is that 60% of the cost in an e-discovery scenario are related to the document review. And if we dig down deeper into that, we see that 35% of that cost is related to involving internal, farm, you know, bilingual and trilingual attorneys and hiring external bilingual attorneys because in many cases they may not exist in, in the law firm. You know, the bilingual attorneys are not easily found. So as you can imagine, the cost of these attorneys is very, very high. And technology is needed. You know, the, in the document review process, technology assisted review is a critical element of reducing these costs because um, and also being able to to address you know the court requirements in a timely manner so this is a view of a typical um, empty customization workflow with an e-discovery this 
it's actually quite similar to what would be in national security as well, where you have, you find a computer with, from a terrorist, and then you go through, you uh, you analyze it, you you make sh you extract the data that's needed. Some data might need to be OCR, some data might might need to be transcribed because they exist in some sort of MP3 or some sort of audio or video format that has been recorded on the, on the computer. Then you need to break it down by language, and once you identify the languages, you pass it to machine translation, and then it goes to human review, and there is a cycling back. And through this process, we identify the most relevant, the most important, and the documents that go into a courtroom. Some of these documents may even need human translation because they they clearly suggest that this is as close to the smoking gun as we're going to get. And so for those documents, you want to have the best possible translation. So this data triage process is typical of the litigation scenario. And again, uh, a way to address this is through having an empty solution that maintains and completely um, secures your data, is, has the ability to be optimized around the specific quality requirements that you may have around the terminology. So, for example, if you're doing analysis on emission inspections, you need to understand all the terms related to emission inspection. Generic MT does not do that. You know, enterprise-focused MT is needed to be able to address that problem. Um, and the uh, integration into your infrastructure is also very necessary. So we are also seeing that the world is changing and that we have the most popular taxi companies now own no taxis. You know, the most popular entertainment companies own no theaters. And this digital disruption is going to continue. Um, there's surveys done saying that this disruption is going to destroy or is, is going to dramatically reduce the influence of 40% of today's leading companies. This is especially apparent in the retail industry. And it's because in the process of interaction with the, with the customer, um, we, we lose a little bit of leeway. So in the in the overall relationship with the customer, we can see here an example where you see the customer satisfaction scores, even though they're at 90% at, at the research phase or at the purchase phase or the service and support phase, by the time you look at the whole cycle, you know, you're down to 66%. So for those companies that have lower than 90% um, customer satisfaction, service and support and, you know, consumer experiences, it is a very serious issue because it means that customers are going to move away from you. They're going to alternatives that are better, that provide better consumer experiences. And this is why um, we see that most of the big data initiatives today are focused on the consumer experience aspect of it. And Gartner has again identified that 64% of big data projects today are focused on understanding that customer experience. So when we look at this, you know, we see that this is, you know, it, it has reached crisis situation. And, but the Chinese term for the word, you know, the Chinese uh, written form of the word crisis also represents opportunity. And we see that those companies that focus on consumer experience and optimizing consumer experience are doing much better than those that don't. And in fact, there's research done recently that show that consumer experience leaders outperform the consumer experience laggards by as much as six times um, in terms of percent growth per year. Just to throw one more spanner into the works for you know the global enterprise and how they have to deal with all this massive flow of information, the GDPR today now is enforcing that data be protected and, and enforcing that if you don't protect the data, there will be severe financial consequences. So um, this issue is becoming very uh, critical for many organizations. Um, so 
the issue is made especially complicated because the variety of digital types of digital data types are growing. So we see here, you know, that not only is the sheer volume of data growing, but you're now expected to handle a variety of different kinds of uh, um, different kinds of um, text formats and audio formats and video formats. And I will hand over now to uh, Luca, who will talk to you about some of the issues involved with audio and video data, which is becoming much more commonplace today. And he provides some use cases as well. Um, thank you, Kirti. Um, very insightful. Um, uh, so before I get started, I just would like to say that um, uh, here at Nuance, we are very excited about the newly signed the Global OEM Partnership between Nuance and SDL. Uh, so I'm going to explain how we have partnered up and integrated and combined our solutions. Um, so before I do that, uh, for those who don't know much about Nuance, um, Nuance is the market leader in speech recognition, uh, natural language, and uh, conversational uh, AI. Uh, we serve all markets across multiple industries. So just to mention a few points uh, on this slide, uh, we transact over 14 billion service transactions per year. Uh, we manage 1.7 billion web customers engagements per year. We have 80 plus speech recognition products and 40 plus text to speech languages. We have also helped um, organizations to save over $3 billion delivered by the Nuance Enterprise Solution. So how we deliver uh, this and more? Well, um, we do that with a multi-channel uh, approach. Um, so, um, let's see let's say this and before before I talk about that um, let's see why do we offer multi-channel solutions and why it is important uh, well you know today's brands have to offer effortless customer experience engagement to their customers in in order to uh, you know acquire support and retain them so that is where new and so many channel uh, customer engagement portfolio comes in so um, if we picture the typical scenario today, consumer wants to engage with the with the brand in a variety of ways on multiple channels and sometimes using multiple devices and methods of uh, communication simultaneously. So, for example, you have a customer that may be watching a TV and doing some price checking and product research on the tablet, and while having a chat with the brand customer. Uh, service, uh, you know, via uh, Facebook messengers, for example. So all of that at the same time, and is expecting a seamless and effortless experience while doing it. So it's quite complicated, and in uh, we understand that 90% of customers uh, expect a consistent experience across all channels. 84% uh, of customers expect proactive communication from the brand. And 40% are willing to stop doing business just because they had a bad IVR experience. So, I mean, this is today's world and today's expectation. So how do we partner up with SDL to deliver this? Well, SDL has embedded in their machine translation engine and in the ETS platform two key components of the Nuance offering. So one is Nuance OCR and the other is Nuance NTE. Uh, so the goal uh, in, with this integration is to, is of basically transforming unstructured data, so paper formats and audio and video content. Um, so the, the idea is to, uh, to, to transform this data, this unstructured data into structured data, so that those can be uh, pushed into ETS and um, allow you to achieve a number of things which I will describe uh, with these slides here. So here in the first slide, with only channel approach in mind, we decided to first integrate OCR uh, into MTE and ETS. So OCR is a basically a leading optical character recognition which uh, in a very fast and easy and accurate way um, uh, basically uh, tra uh, transforms um, uh, unstructured documents into structured documents. So you can instantly turn the paper and digital documents into files which you can edit, search, and share 
uh, across the organization. So OCR is fully integrated uh, with SDL machine translation engine and basically offers a seamless process of uploading and convert and transform unstructured data into text, uh, which can be translated by the SDL uh, translation engine. Then the second step that uh, we, we took uh, was to integrate Nuance transcription engine into ETS and MTE. So in a nutshell, I mean, what is NTE? NTE is a very powerful and fast and accurate engine that uh, quickly transforms uh, massive amounts of uh, recorded audio into actionable assets. Um, and uh, NTE basically quickly uh, uh, and reliably uh, produces uh, search optimized text outputs from multi-speaker audio files, allowing, allowing you to turn enormous volumes of audio into uh, meaningful assets. Um, we support and he supports 23 languages and more than 38 dialects uh, with additional languages being rolled out regularly and uh, is widely used by organizations that need to transform audio and video data into structured text to support audio uh, analytics, for example. So NT integration with SDL ETS um, will allow organizations to have a seamless workflow where you can very simply uh, take an audio file, uh, upload it into the ETS platform, and then this audio file gets automatically transformed into text, and, and the script is uh, it's fully optimized and uh, made ready for, you know, for translation. Um, so we have a number of scenarios. Uh, so let's just mention two typical scenarios on, on how these technologies, they work together. So the first is inside the contact center. So nowadays contact centers are present across many industries. And uh, as mentioned, with NTE, you can transcribe uh, uh, audio and in, in, in extract uh, rich customers inside other. So, for example, you can understand uh, in detail why every single one of your customers is calling you and not just a sample of it. So NTE becomes key to assist you uh, with call classification, topic spotting, emotional or sentiment analysis, and uh, indexing calls to make them basically searchable through simple text queries. Uh, you can also identify which uh, of the contact center agents are delivering the best results and why. Uh, we can, for example, create a text record of customer talking to an agent type of conversation. And then you can collect and analyze not only the words being spoken by the customer, but also how the agent uh, responded to him. We can identify uh, and share best practices across the, the contact center teams uh, at the back of this. And we can also ensure that all the agents are consistent with their scripts so you can meet compliance uh, regulations and requirements. So if, you're, if yours is a business where compliance is a priority, it can be vital to ensure that your contact center agents are delivering your compliance statements correctly and consistently. So NC makes it easy basically to help you automate uh, the processes of confirming that all agents are reading uh, regulatory language verbatim, analyze individual agent performance and make uh, corrections uh, as necessary. Um, its second scenario um, is outside the contact center. So here we have a number of, of these scenarios um, uh, that you know, uh, it would be worth it to mention. Um, so one of these could be, you know, just simplify audio and video indexing and searching. So a lot of businesses have published vast amounts of audio on the web or video and um, have libraries of audio and video uh, assets, which are kind of unlikely web pages can be very poorly indexed. So basically, NC can enable these uh, resources to be comprehensively indexed, made web, web searchable and mineable. Um, and also makes it possible, for example, to identify the position of a specific um, piece of content 
within the audio or video uh, that you're looking for. Um, you can track and transcribe webinars and conference calls and phone interviews, uh, which is, you know, it's, it's really kind of straightforward. So you can capture uh, and document what is being said on a conference call or during an interview and create an accurate and automated archive of critical conversation. Um, and, um, you know, as, as a third requirement, you know, it can support you to uh, become GDPR and MIFID uh, compliant. So um, in the GDPR and MIFID uh, regulations requirements, basically says that all trans transactions, including voice recording and transactions, are kept basically for seven years and are available on request by the ESMA. So under trade transparency, requests for port systems and voice trading systems would need, you know, would need to be recorded. So this requirement is to meet, you know, Article 8.1 and Article 1.7. So basically, GDPR states that the consent of the storage of the data is given by the employee, and personal data is kept as long as required. So the transcription of the transaction data would need to be obfuscated to support the employee privacy data. Where MIFID states transactions have to be recorded, which may include personal data, and, 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 and basically employees have the right to know what is being recorded about them under the GPR. So uh, it's, it's a bit of a conflict because GDPR can request the personal uh, communications are not recorded, which MIFID requires. So how do you solve this dilemma? Well, if the audio data are transcribed, then you can easily index and meet the regulation requirements. Um, there is a fourth uh, example where, for example, uh, you know, requirement is to, to add a new dimension of, to, to market survey. So if you are engaged in market uh, or customer satisfaction uh, surveys, NT can help you to support uh, free-form uh, service by enabling customers to provide open-ended answers, and you can offer uh, them a fast and efficient way to analyze, you know, the voice responses. Um, we can enable also real-time audio for social anal analytics. So, for example, when news or, or comments related to your business uh, hit the media, uh, you may not only want to know about it, but uh, link this to social media activity to see how the news has been uh, received. And uh, last but not least, uh, if you monitor TV and radio news uh, feeds, for example, NTE lets, lets you mine the real-time audio to produce text data that can be fed into ETS or, an, or other AI engines. Uh, so you can basically see what mentions are being made um, of your company or products, for example, a, following a, a, a launch. And uh, you can actually assess how social media has reacted in the following minutes, hours or day in order to basically understand and analyze what has been um, said in the near real time. So these are just few scenarios, use cases, again, inside or outside the contact center on how to leverage, you know, new technology combined uh, with the SDL, uh, ETS, and MTE uh, to enable basically your company to transform unstructured data uh, into structured formats. Um, so that is, uh, you know, my, my, you know my, my piece of it, and uh, I hope this this, this few slides um, give you a quick overview on uh, what can be achieved with uh, with SDL and Nuance combined solutions. Um, with that, I pass it the word to you, Kirsty. Thank you, Luca. Um, so I'm just going to very quickly summarize, um, you know, so that we have time for a few questions. Um, basically, the enterprise challenge with e-discovery information governance is going through large masses of unstructured text, um, documents, PDFs, and now increasingly audio and video content, and to be able to find what you want when you want, which, you know, as Luca explained, the indexation is key to being able to find this. Um, public portals 
empty portals will compromise your data and a secure translation solution is needed. Uh, we've talked about these four kinds of e-discovery of information governance applications and you will see that the volumes of activity in all four cases are going to increase over the coming years. And our solutions, our joint solutions in particular, provide a very effective way to cope with these kinds of use scenarios. The basic problem is to take large masses of unstructured data to understand it and organize it and index it and then make it possible for you to find what you need when you want. And when necessary, you know, SDL can also provide the ability to take the most valuable content and hand it off to very competent human translation services. So it's a complete solution for the process. Um, when needed, we have the ability to tailor the MT very closely to your specific requirements. And we have MT AI experts who can tune the engine for very specific needs or you know, long-term needs in particular when you want to try and track very specific things. And we also have linguistic teams that can go in and help improve and help the MT engines perform to your very specific things. So, you know, while general MT and SDL's general MT are all about the same, you know, they're all equivalent in many ways. You know, there might be a one specific paragraph that might do better in one MT solution than the other. When you tune your MT to the specific needs that you have, you're going to find that the SDL solution provides the best solution. And it provides a means to handle this data deluge and control it. You know, you can control the data security, you can control the way it fits into your organization, and you can control the quality for your specific purposes. So thank you, and I will hand it back to Kate if um, she has any questions. Great. Thank you so much, Katie and Luca, for presenting. Um, I do have a few questions for you that have come in, um, but just to invite everyone now to ask any more questions, there is a question box um, that you can pop those questions in at any time, and we will address them in this last 10 minutes. So um, first question that's come in, I think you touched on this a little bit, Katie, but are there any applications for this in government? Um, yes, the, the ETS and the Nuance technology combined together are perfect for doing any kind of deep digital dive into captured digital assets. You know, so in many cases when uh, national security investigations find a terrorist cell, for example, they may have computers, they may have hard drives that contain information. Um, Often this information is related to specific terrorist planning acti activities and people don't have much time to identify what is, you know, what is of relevance here, you know, what, what are they planning to do? So, you know, they take the, this ability to quickly, nine out of ten times this is going to be in a language that's not English. So um, um, using the nuance and the SDLMT technologies together, you will be able to um, you will be able to figure out what's most relevant. So I mean that's a very common use case. You know this digital exploration of captured digital assets. Great, thank you, Katie. Um, another question that's come in: When will the integration be available? and will it be automatically available to current customers through an updated version, or is this an addition that needs to be purchased? Um, I think that this is a question, I mean, the integration has been done, and it is, it is I think, just about to be released, um, but it requires that there will be some, you know, additional fees need to be paid to Nuance to use their technology. So if you have an ETS license already, it, you don't need to do anything other than update to the latest version and purchase the Nuance uh, capabilities. 
Okay, great. Thank you, Katie. Um, the next question that's come in, uh, can I add company or industry-specific words into the transcription engine? Um, yeah, look, I, can, I can say that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yes, uh, you can actually. Um, is it possible within the transcription to add a uh, vocabulary, a dictionary, uh, which is industry specific or company specific? Um, um, some companies, uh, they also add uh, like full scripts, for example, for agents to read. Um, so that once the agent reads the full script for, you know, for compliancy uh, purposes, the, uh, of course, you know, the accuracy uh, is, is, is spot on and uh, vice versa, it can be cross-checked if uh, the agent um, uh, read exactly those words. Uh, so yes, you can add words, you can add scripts, and you can add, um, uh, you know, acronyms and uh, uh, whatever it is more uh, relevant to your organization. Great, so thank you, Luca. And I think another one to you, so I'm probably going to go right back to you. Um, up to how many speakers um, the transcription engine can to, can transcribe? Okay, so yes, so so we do um, um, handle up to uh, six speakers. So you can have uh, six people um, speaking uh, on the same call. For so a conference call is is a uh, the classic scenario, and so the engine would understand uh, which person is saying what, and will basically transcribe in the uh, the, the full conversation in a way where you can uh, un you can basically uh, assess if it was speaker A or speaker B or speaker C to say the, you know those words. So the maximum is six. Um, we also have, which you know, it's called the diarization, We also have some. Uh, plans in the future to ex to expand uh, from six to, to eight. Uh, but it's a quite a complex, uh, um, uh, you know, feature. And yes, we do provide that up to six people. Perfect. Thank you. Um, okay, another question that's come in. Do you need to set a language before transcribing a file? That's a, that's a, it's a really good question. Uh, no, you don't. Uh, with most engines, you do, but uh, with new ones, uh, NT, you don't. The um, uh, the engine uh, automatically understands which language has been spoken, and then it sets itself on on that language and uh, and basically transcribe it. Um, this is extremely helpful if you are in a multi-language um, and uh, contact center or you know a company where people might have different conversations in different languages at the same time. So, uh, so it's automatic. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Luca. Um, okay, so that is all the questions actually that we have today. So I think we can now close the webinar and thank everyone for coming. So thank you very, very much for attending and also Luca and Kirti for presenting. Um, we hope you found today's session useful and we'll be sharing the recording with you very shortly. We look forward to seeing you again on one of our future webinars in the Top 10 Enterprise Machine Translation Series. And have a great rest of the day and great Easter holiday for those that are celebrating. Thank you. <laughs>